Hi, I'm Marissa Peterson and I'm a budget analyst with the budget and innovation team here at the City of St. Paul. Alright, so today we'll be talking about the City of St. Paul's budget. Alright, so why is public budgeting important? It is important because the budget impacts everything in government. It is an inseparable part of the general activities and policies that are implemented in city government or any other jurisdiction. In fact, the budgeting process is an integral part of how, of how government sets its priorities. For this reason, it is especially important for city boards and commissions to develop a good understanding of this process. So this slide provides some examples of the diversity of initiatives and projects that have been implemented um, through the City of St. Paul's budget in recent years. Everything from supporting the standard functions of municipal governments such as snow emergencies to economic development projects such as the Ford plant site redevelopment um, in the Lower Town Ballpark to new initiatives such as the Paid Parental Leave um, initiative which was introduced in the City of St. Paul's 2015 budget. And also the budget can um, help support innovation and technology projects to help make the city more efficient and effective in its service delivery. Okay, so budgets are also how government sets its priorities. So the budget process is about allocating scarce resources. Um, through the budget process, elected officials have to make decisions about how to allocate resources to competing short and long-term priorities. And they have to balance existing preferences of voters with the needs of future generations. So budgets are also how elected officials launch new programs and initiatives. Understanding how the city budget process works is especially important for citizens on boards and commissions because these bodies are often tasked with providing funding recommendations for various policies and programs. In St. Paul, the Cultural Star Board and the Capital Improvement Budget, or CIB Committee, are two examples of bodies whose recommendations are very important to developing the city's budget priorities. So learning about the structure of the budget and the process of how it is established is going to be a powerful tool to help, help you evaluate competing priorities and to be more effective and influential advisors. Some information that you should know about St. Paul's budget includes the timeline for the budget process, some key terminology that we use, um, and what we spend our money on and where our revenue comes from, and what challenges we face. Okay, so St. Paul is a strong mayor city. So in this system, the mayor prepares and administers the city budget, but the city council also has to approve and adopt the budget. The budget process is formal, and it's designed to conform with Minnesota law. The city budget cycle runs parallel to the calendar year, and the process to develop the budget begins in February, but the bulk of the decision making relative to the budget begins to take place in June and July, during what we call the mayor's phase of the budget process. When the mayor, the, during this phase, the mayor meets with departments and evaluates their proposals. The mayor then proposes his budget in mid-August, and thereafter is considered the council phase of the budget when the city council reviews and adopts the budget in mid-December. So this is important, an important piece to know because um, it helps you know who has, you know, decision, who is making decisions about the budget at what time. So from the beginning of June through mid-August, the mayor has the budget. So he is the one that's kind of meeting with department leaders and making decisions. And then thereafter, the council is evaluating the budget. So it helps you know who you should contact at what time during the budget process. All right, so this slide provides a snapshot of St. Paul's total adopted budgets in 2014 and 2015. You can see there was about a 2% increase in the total budget in 2015. So next, I'm just going to break down um, some of the different components that go into this total budget. So at the highest level, the city's total budget is separated into the capital and the operating budgets. First, the city's capital budget is used for the construction, purchase, or renovation of large physical assets. Um, projects are eligible for funding through the capital budget if they finance the acquisition, betterment, physical development, redevelopment, or other, imp other improvement of city-owned land and buildings. And they have to have a useful life of at least 10 years. So the capital budget is essentially um, made up of many multi-year project budgets. Examples of projects that are funded through the capital budget include road construction, bridges, playgrounds, libraries, rec centers, and police and fire stations. So the capital budget is prepared on a biannual basis and is also um, often funded through long-term borrowing or bonds. The other big part of the budget is the operating budget, um, which includes funding for the continued operation of basic city services. So this includes city employee expenses, services and materials, and debt payments. This budget is prepared on an annual basis and is funded primarily through taxes, fees, intergovernmental revenue, and grants. 
When we discuss the operating budget, we often look at it in two parts, the portion that is financed through the general fund and then the portion that is financed through all other special funds. So first, um, special funds are funded with dedicated revenue that is tied directly to an expense. Some examples include water and sewer and water utilities, grant funds, the city's print shop, and the asphalt plant. One thing to note is that the revenue for the city's special funds comes in a variety of ways. For example, the sewer and water um, utilities and the asphalt plant are all funds that are financed primarily through user fees or direct charges, whereas the grants usually come from an outside body such as federal government. And the city's print shop is primarily an internal service fund. The general fund is primarily funded through um, general, fund, general revenues that are not tied to a specific expense. So this would include property taxes, local government aid from the state, or LGA, and other general revenues such as building permits um, or business licenses and such. Um, so city departments that are primarily funded through the general fund include the police and fire departments as well as parks and recreation and the libraries. The general fund is where the largest portion of the debate over the budget priorities occurs because this is primarily um, because the funding for the general fund is the most vulnerable to political pressures and the revenue is often scarce compared to the growth and cost of city services. So we'll talk a little more about these funding streams in the following slides. This slide gives a high level snapshot of where most of the general fund money is spent by department. You can see that the public safety departments account for over 57% of the total general fund spending while all other departments, including parks and libraries, account for about 43%. This graph shows where general fund dollars go based on type of expense. As you can see, a vast majority of general fund money goes towards funding personnel expenses, almost 82%, and about 51% of those personnel expenses come from the public safety departments, which are primarily police and fire. The second largest type of expense is services at about 12%, and all other types of expenses account for about 6% of general fund spending. So this graph shows that the bulk of general fund resources goes towards funding employee salaries. And of those employee expenses, a large part are dedicated to funding police officers and firefighters. This can help illustrate, why hard illustrate some of the hard decisions that have to be made when allocating the scarce general fund resources. Significant budget reductions in the general fund generally mean having to reduce employee expenses. So now that we have an idea of um, where the city spends its money, we can dive deeper into some of the major revenue, revenue sources in our budget. So the first major revenue source for the city of St. Paul is property taxes. Minnesota's system of collecting property taxes is kind of complicated and unlike most other states. In many other states, the amount of taxes collected by the city rises and falls along with property values. Whereas in Minnesota, the city sets a levy, along with other jurisdictions such as the county and school board, and it collects the levied amount regardless of what happens to property values. The benefit of this system is that revenue raised tends to remain stable. However, because the formula for your annual tax bill combines multiple factors, including the levies, as well as, mar as, well as the market value of your property and the market value of properties around you, it can create shifts in the tax burden to different properties in any given year. So to illustrate this, let's say that in a given year, the city levies a total of $11,000. And there's only one house, a business, and one tax-exempt property in the city, such as a church. So based on the formula to derive a property tax bill, which includes factors such as the levy, the property's market value, and the classification of that property, let's say that it's determined that year that the house will pay a $1,000 tax bill and the business will receive a $10,000 tax bill and then the tax-exempt property will pay zero dollars in tax. Now let's say that the next year the levy remains unchanged, so the city sets a flat levy, but the market value of the house decreases. So this means that the business is going to have to take a greater share of the burden and pay hundred dollars more in property taxes. So the amount paid by each property, besides the tax-exempt property, changed while the amount collected by the city stayed the same. Now let's say that the house turns into a tax-exempt property. This means that the business will now receive the full $11,000 tax burden. So you kind of get an idea of how property tax bills can shift while the levy remains unchanged. This can be kind of frustrating um, and confusing to homeowners because let's say that you see the mayor sets a flat levy one year, same as the year before, or even decreases the levy, but in that same year, a homeowner or a business owner could see an increase in their property tax bill. 
The second largest general fund revenue the city receives is LGA from the state. Cities in Minnesota began receiving LGA in 1971, and for many years it was adjusted annually based on inflationary growth. However, the revenue formula changed in 2003, and there's also a, there was also a mid-year adjustment in the total allocation that year to address a state budget shortfall. So as you can see, since 2003, um, LGA that has been given to the City of St. Paul has almost remained flat or has decreased. Despite a significant bump of $10 million in 2014 and another increase of $1.4 million in 2015, LGA still remains about $45 million below the 2002 level when you index that to inflation. This graph um, kind of further illustrates that point and shows the percent of St. Paul's general fund um, that's made up of property taxes or LGA. As you can see, as LGA has become less reliable, property taxes have had to grow as a percentage of general fund revenue to make up for that shortfall. But you can see that it's still not a great, as great a percent as LGA was in 2002. The third major source of St. Paul's revenue that we'll discuss is user fees and direct charges. To spread costs more broadly among everyone that benefits from city services and to help hold down property taxes, St. Paul charges user fees. These direct charges are appropriate in cases where costs and benefits to a specific user can be measured, billed, and collected efficiently. Some examples of this in St. Paul are our right-of-way maintenance charges, which helps pay for street services, such as snow, remo snow removal, and it is applied to all properties, even those that are tax-exempt as well as our sewer fees and parking meters are also examples of user fees and direct charges, or fees that someone might pay when they go to a city-owned golf course or a uh, public swimming pool. So this page breaks down um, what the city taxes and fees would be on a median value, median value home in St. Paul, which was valued at about 130500 in 2014 and then increased to 145000 in 2015. So in total taxes and fees, you can see for a median value, median value home, um, it went up by an estimated $111 in 2015. Some of that was attributable to increases in taxes and fees, and some of it um, can be attributed to shifts in market value. Some budget challenges that um, the City of St. Paul faces now in the foreseeable future include an uncertain state partnership. Uh, looks like LGA is going to be um, pretty uncertain into the future. And also we're concerned about the revenue restrictions on cities as well as levy, which includes levy limits. Um, another concern, as you saw, a large portion of our budget is employee expenses. So the growing cost of labor creates a lot of pressure on our budget into the future. And another concern is maintaining a stable revenue collection and spreading the burden evenly among beneficiaries, which can be difficult in St. Paul with a large number of tax exempt properties including all of our higher ed institutions and nonprofits that call this city home. And finally, the major challenge that comes with creating a budget for the city is continuing to reach public expectations with scarce resources. So our final slide gives you an idea of um, the general fund gap between expenses and revenue that the city faces every year. This shows that in the coming years, we are projected to face between an 8 and $11 million budget gap, and even if all of our general fund revenues increase at the rate of inflation, we could still have a gap of about 2 to 5 million, um, 2 to 5.5 million every year, so in the coming years. So it shows that in St. Paul, we will have to continue to prioritize resources and look for ways to increase efficiencies while maintaining the level of service our citizens have come to expect. So with that, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to present this information about the City of St. Paul's budget, and here's our web address and my email address. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out.